The Fallout series has been the stage for all manner of bizarre monsters. Everything from mutated tapeworms to two-headed cows. But one of the weirdest creatures ever was intended for the first installment. Before the Great War, there was a lab in Southern California called West Tech Research Facility. But in 2077, it took a direct hit from a nuclear warhead. By the time the player arrives in 2161, this area is now known as the GLOW because of the high levels of radiation that surround it. There's a hollow disk at the GLOW that details the effects of FEV on various test subjects, and it reveals the origin of several creatures. But one of these logs is more notable than the others. Log date January 12, 2076. With batch 11-011, we've improved the meiotic cycle efficiency by 43%. We've infected 53 raccoons with the new strain. In addition to the now expected size increase, behavioral tests confirmed an increase in intelligence and manual dexterity by 19 points on the Schuler Cap Index. Unfortunately, several subjects escaped confinement and had to be hunted down and dispatched. Major Barnett ordered the remaining subjects terminated. Two pairs were unaccounted for. This entry is the last in-game reference to a cut race of mutated raccoons. An artist at Interplay made a piece of concept art that gives us the only look at how they might have appeared, though I'm sure their sprites would have been depicted much differently. A while back, a modder named Ursa made some sprites of how they might have looked, and I think these look pretty dope, though this version is way more menacing than the way I imagined them personally. Most of the time when content is cut, all you can do is look at what remains and speculate, but there are no other in-game remnants of these raccoons. There is something far better though, as the location's design document was released in the Fall Bible and gives us a detailed look at these furry abominations. This document was made by designers Scott Campbell and Brian Freyermuth, who together also wrote the first iteration of Fall's timeline back when it was still utilizing the GURP system. It's a very early early draft and has typos, so I've corrected a few sections for the sake of coherency. The Burrows. Type Farming and Hunting Community of Little Small Animal, Smiley Face. Description. The Burrows is a community made up of mutated animals that escaped the SFEF facility years ago. Now, some parts of this document were circled and needed some kind of revision. For example, FSEF facility is marked, which was the early name for what would eventually become West Tech Research Facility. It is made up of small raccoon-like animals. These animals speak fluent English and are highly intelligent. They have set up their own little community that is a link between nature and man. There are two homes that the animals of the burrows build. One is an adobe-type building that is above ground called Top Dwellings. They are clustered around a giant dead oak tree that serves for their main town hall. This is the center circle. The outer semicircle of the settlement looks like simple earth at first glance. This is actually the the dens where the other half of the town lives. These consist of an entrance that's usually camouflage that leads to an underground den. These homes are usually cluttered and crude and filled with various odds and ends. The area around the burrows is pretty lush compared to the rest of the wasteland, and this is because of the river that runs through it. It is also lush because the original spot was pretty far from any bomb sites. The plants and trees that grow there are jungle-type plants that can survive the intense heat. Nareska, leader of the mutant animals that made their long and hard trek from the glow, arrived at this beautiful oasis in the late winter of 2101. They quickly set up camp and for a while the animals were peaceful. Their instincts took over, which was a shock to most. They became skilled hunters and managed to grow intellectually. They had brought a good many devices and ancient texts from the glow and they were discovering new things. They even named themselves the Tribe of the Salanter, not knowing or remembering that they were once raccoons. Salanter means the kindred in their language. At first they made their buildings like that of mankind. Nareska, knowing that most of his tribe remembered the things that man had done to them, did not model the burrows after a human city. While the burrows was human looking, the things inside were not. Nareska encouraged his followers to revel in their animal side. Most houses consist of twigs and leaves even to this day. There were some that were too curious for their own good though. Small bands explored outside the oasis and in 2106, a small band of Salanter met up with a group of humans who would later become the jackals. Upon seeing the animals, the humans opened fire, but a few Salanter made it back to the community and that's where the first split came. 
Half of the animals wanted to protect themselves against the humans, so they built the dens. They also rigged various traps in the jungle. So the division stayed and those who wanted to believe in technology remained up top, while those who were more animalistic went underground. Yet these divisions did not bother the Salanter. It was true that Nareska was their leader, but the animals could more or less do what they wanted as long as they never violated a few simple rules. This basically stated that no Salanter could harm or kill another without having their crimes done onto them. This does not say that contests of strength are unallowed though. Any unauthorized entry on a home must be told to the head council. The perpetrator will then be ostracized until the next moon or one month, and during this punishment no one will talk to him or acknowledge that he exists. These laws came into effect in 2108 when two Salanter got into a fight over a home. Anyway, the years passed peacefully. The Salanter became fiercely proud of each other and the tribe grew. A few human strangers wandered in the jungles but were either turned away or killed by the den dwellers, usually the latter. Thus, the Burrows has gained a kind of legendary status among humans. No one is sure it's there, but stories of intelligent animals are common in the wasteland. Finally, in 2120, Nuraska died. The Burrows was in a state of mourning, and on the day he died, each Salanter lifted their howling voices to the heavens. This resulted in a mourning song that is still sung to this day whenever a Salanter dies. After Nuraska died, his son Minishin took over. His leadership lasted until 2140 when he retired and his daughter Renard took over. Before I go on, something must be said about the religion of the Salanter. The old ones, as they were called, never told the younger generation about their experiences back at the facility. They simply said that they came from the glow. It was named this after an old one tried returning and all he saw was a great glow on the horizon. He turned back. The old ones told their children to forget the glow and that the burrows was their home now. But when Naraska died, who was the last original survivor from the facility, the younger generation started to wonder where they came from. They read the old ones journals, read the old books written before the war, but nothing else was mentioned except that the glow was where the Salanter came from. The winter of 2030 was especially harsh for the Salanters. Known as the Great Winter in many parts of the Waste, the Salanter had nothing to fall back on and despair set in. Finally, their leader Minishin realized that something must be done to give his tribe hope. Thus, he invented the religion of the glow. He told his followers that there were gods living in the glow and that these gods made them. He made references to them in histories that they had, showing various journals of the old ones talking about masters and how they made them. When the great winter ended, Minishin knew that there would be more hard times. Thus, he kept the religion going, saying that the gods of the glow helped them survive. And for the next 30 years, this has been passed down to the next generation, and only Minishin knew that this religion was false. When he died in 2050, he took the secret with him. No one could disprove it either, since anyone who went looking for the glow never returned. Which brings us to the beginning of 2061, just before the player is let out of the vault. During this time, a group of top dwellers, intent on finding out the truth behind the gods of the glow, went seeking their ancient home and found it. The radiation at the facility is very high and most of them died as a result. Only one made it back. When he returned, he had a severe case of radiation poisoning and was dying. Before passing away, his last words were, there are no gods, only death. This caused quite a stir and now the burrows is divided once again, but this time it might lead to outright war. The den dwellers, being more fierce and feral than their cousins on top, believe in the gods with all their hearts. The top dwellers, being the intellectuals, believe the words of the dying Salanter, stating that this is proof that the gods of the glow don't exist. You can clearly see how much effort went into the description alone, and we get a lot of cool information about these cut creatures. Everything from their history to their culture, architecture, their lineage of rulers, a death ritual, a class system, and even a religion linked to an in-game location. I can think of many factions that appeared throughout the series that didn't have this level of detail put into their design. The next part gives information about the leader of the Salanter, Renar, who is the great-granddaughter of Nerus. 
Nebraska. She sleeps in a small house behind the entrance of the great tree at the end of the garden. She has nine offspring, all of whom she is extremely protective of. A note then mentions that this might have to change depending on the art. The next paragraph details the Solanter class system. The community is made up of two groups, the den dwellers and the top dwellers. For 60 years, the two have been able to love each other like brothers, but the current debate on religion has weakened those bonds. Both sides would die for their leader, however, Ever, and right now, she is the only thing keeping war from breaking out. Most are distrustful of humans, especially the den dwellers, but if you can get past them, talking to the top dwellers shouldn't be that difficult. The top dwellers have texts that say humans are evil, but they are skeptical if that's really true and will be curious. It then expands on how the Solanter wage combat. The den dwellers are armed with knives, claws, teeth, and even some small spears. They usually hunt in packs. There are no guards, and if there's a crisis, everyone in the burrows, even the young and old, will fight to protect it. There is then a section on notable locations, and the burrows' main area would have been called the Great Tree. This is used for a town hall, tavern, and entertainment. In the middle of the dead tree, there is an area used for Contest of Strength. Interestingly, that's the second mention of Contest of Strength, suggesting they had some sort of competition the player could compete in. Perhaps the player could have fought them in hand-to-hand -hand combat, or could see who could collect the most shiny objects. Behind the meeting hall is a section that houses three storage rooms. One is a library filled with books and information. Another area is used for research, and there's some interesting devices here. The last room houses a small shrine to the gods of the glow. There are multiple journals and a crude altar here. There was also meant to be a notable area called the garden, which would have been found directly behind the great tree, but unfortunately very little information is given about it. The next section lists notable NPCs in the burrows, and the first is Renar, leader of the Solanter. One of Renar's offspring was named Kali Ya, and would have been an important NPC too. Finally, there was Mech, a den dweller who knew the location of the glow. The following segment explains their current situation. The burrows is split into two factions, those who believe in the gods of the glow and those who are skeptical. The situation is becoming volatile. The next section divulges the situation when the player first enters. There are various traps in the jungle to keep strangers out, and there are various ways to get around them. Once through those, however, the player will be ambushed by four den dwellers. Then two top dwellers will appear and come to the player's aid. Before the battle starts, however, a voice will ring out and say stop. Then Renar will appear. She will chastise the den dwellers and top dwellers both for trying to kill each other. She will also look at the player very closely and seeing that he isn't a mutant, will tell him to go to the Great Tree. One of the top dwellers is assigned as a guide. The player is not to stray from the path, and if he tries to do so, the den dwellers will attack in force. Of course, at this point, the player could be Eric and just kill the four den dwellers anyway. Once at the tree, the search for the glow adventure seed begins. The second to last sentence seems to be a reference to Eric Jameson, an artist who worked on the game's iconic talking heads. Apart from apparently killing everything, he would later go on to work on projects like Parasite Eve and Final Fantasy VIII. Next, four adventure seeds or quests are listed, and the first was called The Search for the Glow. This is the opening scene when the player first enters the town. Renard tells the player their troubles, and says that the player is the first human in 60 years to hold a conversation with the Solanter, but these are desperate times. She tells the player about the division, and that the player must search for the glow. When asked why him and not a Solanter, Renard brings him back behind the table to a secret panel behind the wall. There she pulls pulls out an old diary written by Nareska himself. There are pages missing, but humans are mentioned as being the Solanter's captors back in the old days. It talks about weapons and other such stuff. Renard believes that these humans are what the Solanter considered gods. She wants the player to bring back proof of this so the den dwellers will not declare war on their cousins. To guide the player to the glow, Renard assigns a den dweller to lead him there. The den dweller is also there to confirm that there are no gods 
of the glow. The player can bring back Cheapaw's journal for proof or any other things, maybe a hologram or something. If he does, the Solanter will become allies, with the top dwellers giving the player loyalty and the den dwellers giving him respect. I actually really like the premise of this quest, reuniting the quarreling groups by disproving their fabricated religion. It also would have been a nice addition to have another quest that sent you to the glow, and the storyline likely would have improved the location. Presumably the guide who took the player to the glow was the previously mentioned notable NPC mech. If the player completed the previous quest and disproved the raccoon gods, the Trade Lines quest would become available. After the player gains the trust of the Salanter, at least the top dwellers, Renar will ask him to open Trade Lines with humans, but only humans that the player deems appropriate. If the player tells Junktown they won't care, the only places that will care are the Hub and the Cons. The Hub will open Trade Lines, and every now and then the player will be able to see a caravan going there. The Hub will also reward you for finding them another customer. The cons will attack the town and try to kill them all. If the player returns after this happens, all he will find are ruins and a few Salanter who will attack him on sight. The Salanter will become his enemy, and any Salanter in the player's party will attack as soon as they enter the village. The reactivity of the burrows either gaining prosperity or being completely destroyed by raiders is really cool. While there are instances of reactivity like the Necropolis being invaded by super mutants, there is really not much reactivity on an environmental scale like the Solantra's home being reduced to ruins, and something like this would have been amazing. Notably, the last line of the quest description mentions Solantra being in the player's party, suggesting there might have even been a raccoon companion. The next quest was called to catch a wisp. Something has been stealing the children. The Solanter, being a superstitious lot, believe that a ferocious beast has taken them. The only sign of its passing they find is an area that's broken and disheveled as if from a fight. The children are also ferocious fighters, but there are never any tracks or scents. They call this beast the Wisp, and it has taken on an almost mythical quality. A curfew has been set, and the Den Dwellers have been setting up extra traps along the river. The mother of the latest missing cub asked the player to find her child. On investigating the scene of the latest disappearance, the player will see broken branches, etc., as indicated by a struggle. A closer look will reveal that whatever did this covered up their tracks quite masterfully. The Salanter, who have had no contact with humans, do not know about this trick to hunt. To them, stealth is something you do while hunting, not while trying to escape. Also found around there will be various pieces of clothing that the Salanter overlooked. The bits of cloth have definite markings on them. Any run-in with the jackals will make the player recognize the symbol as theirs. If the player has never seen the jackals and shows the cloth to Renar or any other Salanter, they will shrug and say it looks human. They'll also make a suggestion to search human encampments for answers. Either way, Renar will say that if it is true humans have kidnapped their children, there will be bloodshed. Both Junktown and the Hub will know the Jackal symbol. The player can gain information any number of ways. The one thing for sure is that the Jackals do not have the children, but they know who does. Seems a Jackal named T-Bone was hired by someone to check out the legends of the Animal Men who live near the Radiation Crater down south. Looking down there, he stumbled across a Salanter child who wandered too far south from the burrows. Since then, he and a band of thieves have snuck past the traps and stolen the children. They figure that the animals are just that, animals. Children talk the Salanter language until they come of age. After that, they only learn English as a way to remember the old ones. T-Bone will tell the player that they sold the children to a strange caravan that goes back and forth across the wasteland. The caravan is owned by a man who calls himself the Great P.T. Barnum. The caravan itself is made up of several exhibits. The cool thing is that if the player is mad about T-Bone taking the children, he can kill him, as the rest of the jackals could care less. Through various pieces of information, the player can find his way to the caravan and confront the owner. His strange story is as follows. His whole line of descendants were circus owners. Even after the Great War, his grandfather taught his father everything he knew about the business. He knew that one day things would settle down and people would need entertainment again. Their family lived in the vault for some time. They came from the same vault the settlers of the hub 
came from, until finally coming to live in the hub. Once there, PT's grandfather set up a nightclub filled with magicians and such. His father took over the business, which is still doing well in the hub. PT knew he was different though. He wanted to travel, to see the world. So he bought a caravan and set out into the wasteland. He had collected quite a few things, and he has even made a few creatures of his own. Taking the original Barnum's advice that there's a sucker born every minute, he actually started out with a show that consisted of a few dancers, some acrobats, and other things, and for a while he did well, especially with the cons who loved his dancing women. For a while things went well, but as time went on the performers started to leave. Finally, he was left alone with his mutated animals and his makeshift wonders. He was on his way back to the hub when he heard stories about the animal men. It was said the strange creatures lived by the radioactive pit down south. It was said that there were animals that walked like men and who hunted using weapons. Few have returned from there, and those who do cannot actually say what they saw. When P.T. Barnum asked questions, everyone shrugged. Who cared about the stupid animals when there were families to feed, mutants to ward off and lives to live. The main reason that the Salanter have gone undetected for so long is that most people have bigger problems and no one really cares anyway. PT became obsessed with these rumors, and he knew these things which no one had ever seen would make him famous. For a year, he collected information until he finally pinpointed an approximate location. Knowing that he wasn't equipped for this type of thing, he went to a jackal he knew and asked him to capture the legendary beast, which he did. When the player finds the caravan, PT will be paranoid and in possession of a shotgun. The player can talk him down, PT will then tell him his history, but under no circumstances will he give the children back, that is unless the player gets them something better. The thing is he tried showing the children to some travelers who were completely bored by the small furry rodents. There is said to be a rare red scorpion that lives in LA that he wants. It seems that after the disappointment of the animal men, PT wants to move back to the hub, but his father needs the red scorpion's venom for something. Not too many people will make it through the barrens and back. Once the player kills the red scorpion, PT will give the player the children and be on his way. Once the children are returned, even the den dwellers will be loyal to the player, since a few of the den dweller children were also taken. The mother of the recent lost cub will also give the player some cool stuff. So in summary, the Salanter children were being kidnapped by a jackal named T-Bone, then being sold to the owner of a traveling circus who has a highly detailed backstory. After hunting down and killing a rare creature, the player could return the Salanter children to their home and get some cool loot for their trouble. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this quest are the references to the jackals. In the final game, there's only a single major faction of raiders, the Khans, a group of raiders who emerge from Vault 15. However, there were originally meant to be three rival raider gangs that formed from the population of Vault 15. The Khans, the Jackals, and the Vipers. The Jackals and Vipers would end up getting scrapped too, but despite that, they're still actually mentioned in the dialogue of various characters most notably by Aradesh and Shady Sands. While there is an unused, unfinished map of the Viper's camp, nothing remains of the Jackal's encampment mentioned in the document. Both groups would finally appear in New Vegas 13 years later, though they unfortunately play a very small role. It also mentions that the Burrows is located near the Glow. I always assumed the region around it was empty due to the extreme radiation, so it's interesting they planned an additional location, even if it wasn't meant to be. The next quest was called The Woodcutter's Wife. One of Renar's offspring, Kali Ya, has disappeared. Normally this wouldn't be unusual, but others found the place where she was last seen. The area was smashed as if a great fight happened there and there were footprints. Human footprints. Renar thinks that one of the human groups has somehow made it past the trap slash guards and then taken her. She has already sent out two Salanter hunters, only to have them disappear too. She thinks the player can reason with whoever did this. When the player comes to the scene of the disappearance, he sees the tracks, dried now but still visible. If the player has any kind of tracking skill, he will see that the tracks are human but slightly strange. If the player follows the tracks, he will come to a wooden bridge that spans the river. Any PC or NPC with detect traps will see the tripwires on the bridge. If not and the player trips over it, the bridge will collapse, sending him into the water. Once on the other side of the bridge, the player will 
have to get past all sorts of traps and puzzles. This is because the one who set the traps is a descendant of an old survivalist. Before this gets confusing, here is the background behind this seed. An old survivalist named Bill Hatch, having mutated a bit from the virus, hence the human but not human tracks, is living alone on the other side of the river. Bill's father kidnapped a jackal woman a while ago and had Bill. Bill is completely insane. The mental illness started when his parents died and he was bitten by a mutated beetle. After he survived that, Bill kidnapped a short mutant woman from Junktown about three years ago, but she died. In his grief, he went out hunting one morning and came across Kaliya. He kidnapped her and currently thinks that she is his wife. The traps around the area were set by Bill's grandfather to ward off those damn liberals. Bill still uses the term, although he doesn't know what a liberal is. Bill keeps them up to defend himself against the unknown evil liberals that he thinks are after him. Meeting up with Bill, the player can talk to him for a bit, but Bill will probably fight to protect his bride. Inside his house, the player can find ammo and a few weapons. This quest is similar to Catch a Wisp in that the player would once again be rescuing a kidnapped Solanter, but some elements of it are still intriguing. The bridge leading to the area being trapped and collapsing sounds awesome. An entire section filled with traps could have made the trap skill more useful as well, as you can easily complete the game and not spend any points on the skill. I also really like the idea of Bill's character. I love that he's lost all notion of the meaning of the word liberal and believes this evil evil unknown force is coming to get him. There is yet another reference to the jackals too which would have been a nice touch. All in all, I find the Salanter's quest and lore fascinating. In an interview, the creator of Fallout, Tim Kaine, revealed why all of this was cut. As for the burrow, this location was written by an early designer associated with the project. While it was well written, I felt that its content was not appropriate to our Fallout universe, mainly based on its style and feel in the game and not on its artistic merit. So I did not approve its addition to the game and that glow hollow disc is all that remains of any reference to the area. Co-creator of the document Scott Campbell provided a different reason, however, suggesting it was a matter of resources that led to their eventual doom. While Brian was off and running, writing quests for our furry editions, the artist had a scope meeting about the number of characters in the game. We had more design than they had time to actually build and animate, so a compromise was needed. Since the mutant animals were rare, required several sets of armor, and had a totally different set of animations, they were chopped. Poor Brian. He he put so much love into those varmints. Regardless of the exact reason it was cut, Tim Kane was definitely right that they didn't fit into Fault 1's grim atmosphere. By the first sentence of the design document, you can already see a disconnect between this idea and the established tone of the game. Intelligent animals living in a dead tree in a verdant land sounds like something straight out of a fantasy setting. While mutated raccoons would have been jarring in the first game, I do have to wonder how out of place it would have felt in its sequel, a game that already has talking plans and death claws, or any of the other games, as every sequel has included wacky elements that aren't significantly different. These changes would not have made Fallout into an even better game, and ultimately, all of this was left on the cutting room floor.